Welcome back to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier reviews. If you have not already seen episode three titled Power Broker, this is going to be a spoiler filled review. So go and check out that episode on Disney Plus right now and then come back and check out this review. So as you guys have seen, the first two episodes I have loved and episode three just continues on with that. This show has given me everything that I want from a Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. I'm a huge fan of the Captain America movies, especially the Winter Soldier, and this kind of carrying on that tone, that approach, it's exactly what I wanted. So this episode actually had a few surprises in store for me. We finally get the introduction of Zemo. Zemo was the villain in Captain America Civil War. A lot of people were kind of rough on him. They didn't think that he was one of the better MCU villains. They thought that he was kind of boring I guess because he's not wearing a costume and doesn't have superpowers, but I'm one of the few that actually hold him in probably my top five, top seven MCU villains. I thought he was really interesting. I thought that his whole story was really emotional. And I actually liked the non-conventional approach of having a villain that's just a guy, that's just a, a guy pulling strings and manipulating the Avengers from behind the scenes rather than a superpowered being that's wearing a suit and trying to punch them to death in the third act. So I really liked him. Him coming back in this, I was surprised by the fact that he's actually not 100% villain yet. Like, you get to the whole thing in the beginning where, after it left off in episode two, where they were talking about we have to go talk to Zemo. This one carries on with that. They go, Winter Soldier goes and talks to Zemo, and I love the effect where he's sitting in the shadows and he starts giving those code words for the Winter Soldier again. He just cuts him off and he's like, yeah, that, that shit doesn't work anymore. I thought that was really neat. Uh, and the whole effect of him breaking him out of prison without telling Sam until like he gets to the end of his like, yeah, I'm gonna tell you like a for instance, all right? I'm gonna give you like a hypothetical situation. And he tells him how they're gonna break him out of prison. And then immediately after his story is over, Zemo just walks in and he's already carried out that plan. I thought that was really neat. But I was surprised with from then on, once they decide to work on with Zemo and the episode starts, Zemo actually is working with them. There's not really, you could tell there's something nefarious there. And maybe by episode four or five, he's probably gonna start pushing things in his own direction and eventually become a villain again. That's pretty obvious. But at least for now, I was surprised at how well he worked with them as a team. He was sitting there, he was kind of the leader. He's telling them how they're gonna go and infiltrate certain places. He's giving them roles, telling them what to say. You find out he's rich as hell and he's got this private plane. And just, I really enjoyed his whole integration into this episode. And for, for me personally, it actually enhanced how much I liked that character. Like I liked him enough just in the little bit that we got of him in Civil War, but this really makes him one of my favorite MCU villains thus far. And I'm sure it's gonna get even better throughout the series. We quickly get into this city or this town called Madripoor, which apparently is pretty heavy in the Marvel comics. It's actually got a pretty good amount of lore there. I love this entire sequence for more reason than one. First and foremost, I just love the look of this town. I love the way that it's shot. I love all the colors, the neon aesthetic to it. It almost has like a John Wick chapter two type flavor to it. And when you can accuse both of the Captain America movies of being maybe a little bit gray as far as their color scheme, because they're going for that 70s espionage type feel, this show has certainly carried that on, but this episode showed that they have more to show as far as visual aesthetics. So that alone, I just loved when they got into this town. But then you get into this whole plot to where Sam has to play this character that he calls a pimp, which I thought was a great line. And, and Winter Soldier, or Bucky, has to play himself as the Winter Soldier, and Zemo is kind of just walking through as this leader. This whole plot that they're going through where they're having to play these different characters, I had a blast with that segment of the show where they go in and Sam can't really say anything because he doesn't really know how to portray this character. He's got to drink this drink that's got like a piece of snake organ in it, and he's like... Ugh. And then even Bucky, whenever it gets to the point where Daniel Brule is like, hey, you're going to have to play the guy that you're telling me doesn't exist anymore. And when he tells him, like, Winter Soldier attack, and he just goes right back into ass beating mode. I love that. And another great line is after he's beating everybody's ass and Zemo just turns over to Bucky and he's like, he fits right back into those shoes pretty well, doesn't he? Or something along those lines. Like this episode had some of the best dialogue of the show so far. There's been a lot of these little quips, these little very Marvel signature funny lines, but this episode was the one where they all genuinely made me chuckle or made me laugh or made me smile. 
and that was one of them. And even after they get into the inner sanctum and they're talking to this contact that they've been trying to sneak their way into, and then Sam gets a phone call and she makes him put it on speaker. That was a pretty tense scene because you're like, oh, this is gonna go bad. And he's taking everything that his sister says and he's formulating it. She's like, hey, we need to go talk to the bank. He's like, yeah, we need to launder some more money. And I, I was laughing at that whole scenario. I was like, he's actually gonna pull it off. Then she calls him Sam and screws it all up and then bullets just come out of nowhere. And then we have our reintroduction of Sharon Carter. Now, she was my favorite part of this episode. As much as I loved Zemo and as much as I love seeing this new side of him and getting more interaction with this guy that I've always kind of felt like a defender of, her being brought back into this and being possibly the most badass one of all of them, I thought was the shit. First of all, I, I like how this show is kind of holding a mirror up against the really shitty scenario that this whole Avengers storyline has created, like where Sam doesn't even get a paycheck and his family's in dire straits, even though he saved the universe. And you have Sharon Carter that very much led to the events of being, you know, the world saved by helping Captain America get his shield back, but she's blacklisted and she's on the run. She didn't get the Avengers treatment that everybody else did. I like how the show is kind of creating those questions. It's showing the more realistic, grounded side to these real fantastical events that we've seen over the past 10 years, and it's making us go, wow, maybe it's not all it's cracked out to be to be an Avenger. But when she's finally into the mix, and then they're going off to try to find this doctor that has created these super soldier serums, there's an action sequence where Zemo, Bucky, and Sam are all interrogating this doctor, and Sharon Carter is outside while these mercenaries, these bounty hunters who are coming after them, are all surrounding these cargo containers, and she just fucks every single one of them up. To me, that was the best action sequence that we've got in the show so far. Now, it's not the biggest, it's not the most big budget, but to me, that's why I love Winter Soldier so much, is that kind of grounded espionage action that it brought and that was the most like that action that I had seen, where she's just stabbing a dude with his own knife and then taking it and throwing it into another guy before she runs and starts pounding him against the, this cargo container and she's getting bloodied up the whole time while they're just in there talking and she's taking out like 17 guys. I thought that was awesome and I'm totally on board for her character. Whatever she's gonna do for the rest of this season, for the rest of the MCU, I want more of this chick because she's bad. But during that whole ass beatery extravaganza, while they're interrogating this doctor, we get to find out a little bit more about this guy who is named Dr. Wilfred Nagal. And he is the one who has created these super soldier serums. And I thought it was interesting how he kind of showed how this came to be, to where he was hired by the government after the fall of Hydra to take the blood samples from Isaiah, calling back to that character. And I'm sure that character is still gonna have much more ramifications throughout this show taking his blood and trying to harness in on the blood cells that are interacting with the serum and trying to reverse engineer his blood. And they're like, well, why didn't, the, why didn't you use this? Why didn't the government take this? And he goes, oh, well, because I disappeared into a cloud of dust. And so the program was shut down by the government. They didn't have their doctor anymore. And now the blip comes back five years later. He doesn't have a government to sell it to because of the events of you know this whole infinity war. And so he starts doing this stuff on the black market where he goes, tries to finish up his research, does it, and all of his serums were, so, uh, were stolen by the lead Flag Smasher girl. And I just thought it was a pretty cool way to continuously reference the blip. Like when we were watching Infinity War and Endgame, I for one did not really hone in on how much of an impact that blip was going to have on the further MCU. My, my focus was all on the events of Infinity War and Endgame and getting people back and stopping Thanos. I didn't really think about the ripple effects that it was going to have in movies like Spider-Man or in shows like this. And to me, every time they reference that and show what that five year gap has done to certain characters in this universe, I think it's a really interesting take. And it, to me, that's one of the more valuable things about Disney Plus being able to do these shows is being able to flesh out on the side these ramifications, these other events that have come from these huge movies and not really take away from the universe, but just add to things. You could probably walk into the next movie and not have to watch these shows, but man, does this really enforce the storyline, the lore, and the character dynamics of the characters involved in these shows thus far. You get a little bit of a window of, you know, Zemo doing his own thing. He just shoots the doctor right in the head. Everybody's gonna stop him. Now, oh, Zemo's a villain now, but no, they all run out. 
He jumps up on top of this cargo container. He puts on that classic comic book Baron Zemo mask and starts taking everybody out, showing not only that he is still on their side to a certain extent, but showing that he's a little bit more of a badass than you might have thought for a guy that was just picking up the phone every once in a while in Civil War and you know moving chess pieces behind the scene. This guy actually could kick some ass. I thought it was a little weird that he only put his mask on to kill two or three people and then immediately took it back off. I guess that was like his, you know, I'm an Avenger now, bitch moment. But other than that, I thought that scene was really cool. Again, reinforcing that character is something that I really enjoy. He picks up this old supercharged car and pulls up. And then I love all the threats where they're like, all right, shit, you're still on our side. But you try that shit again, I'm fucking telling you right now. They then show Sharon Carter kind of getting into somebody's car. She's working with somebody or some agency. Again, I don't have too much knowledge of the comic book world, so I'm sure there's some super MCU nerds out there that are gonna know exactly who she's talking to, but if nothing else, we'll find out in a couple episodes, continuing on that espionage side of this show. But now you have our three characters once again trying to go after the Flag Smashers and you get our final surprise of the episode where they're getting ready to go into this building. Bucky's like, I'm gonna hang back and go for a walk. Something's a little strange. And he goes off and starts picking up these little beads. And I'm wondering, who's he gonna find? What, what is this gonna mean? Who's he gonna walk into? And then he turns around and one of the Wakandian warriors is sitting there, which I believe her name was Ayo or Ayo. I had to look that up because I did not recognize her. And that was a very cool note to end on this episode because not only does it further expand like the reach of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show, now it's involving Wakanda, but it adds this extra level of conflict to where they're trying to work with Zemo, but of course the people of Wakanda want vengeance for the death of King T'Chaka. And it also begs the question of, is this going to flesh out what we can expect from the Wakanda or the Black Panther universe from here on out? post the death of Chadwick Boseman. So I really don't know if they're gonna attack that at all or if there's gonna be any kind of a hint of what to expect from the eventual Black Panther 2, but it's a very unexpected thing for me to be focusing in, focusing in on a Falcon and Winter Soldier show and all of a sudden now be thrown into what is going on in Wakanda. I thought that was a really cool, subtle way to expand what the reach of this show is. So very cool note to end on. All in all, guys, again, I'm just in love with this show. Like everybody that was just gaga over WandaVision, and I certainly had episodes that I loved of that too. That's how I feel about this show. It's everything that I've wanted. It's everything that I have desired for, for an expansion of the Winter Soldier. As soon as they announced the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show, I was like, I'm picturing what this show should be. And it's exactly what they have delivered thus far, along with a lot of surprises like the character of Zemo and Sharon Carter. So, so far, this is probably my favorite episode of the show thus far. What do you guys think? Are you fans of episode three, Power Broker? Are you a fan of going to Madripool and the colorful nature of this? Are you a fan of Zemo working with them? Do you feel like he's gonna go full on villain or do you feel like he's gonna be one of those complicated characters where, I don't know, we gotta keep our eye on this guy, but he's kinda cool. Let me know your thoughts down below. And what do you think we're gonna get as far as answers on Wakanda? Let me know that down below. Let's talk spoilers down below. Talk about some speculation for what is going to happen in the next couple of episodes. Thank you guys for watching. As always, please like and share this video if you enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button so that you can check out all of the further episode reviews that I'm gonna be doing every single Friday. And as always, guys, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.